Before GPT-4 gets a chance to replace us and our loved ones, we want to be able to understand how this model works under the hood and why it's so good at generating realistic text that no model has been able to do before, especially BERT. How is GPT-4 able to pass the SAT, the AP, the LSAT, the BAR, answer programming questions, especially hard questions, and write math proofs better than 90% of humans? You want to know how this model works so it's not just a black box that you communicate with on their API. And in this video, I'll be explaining exactly how to train a GPT-like model, the attention decoder mechanism, which is the key ingredient that explains why ChatGPT and GPT-4 are so good in generating text and why transformers are so powerful, as well as how to actually scale up and optimize transformers for very, very large data sets, as well as future implications of GPT for AGI. After building a small version of GPT from scratch by myself with the help of Andre Karpathy, I learned how a transformer works and I'll be referencing his video throughout this one. So GPT stands for generative so that it generates the next characters in the sentence, pre-trained so that the model is trained on a large portion of the internet, and transformer, and the transformer part is the neural network that combines different attention mechanisms together with the regular output layers of a neural network. A transformer takes a sentence and it breaks it down into different words and uses those words to predict what the next word will be based on the context of the previous words. And we wanna keep looping this so that it takes a sentence and it, the transformer generates a new word, uses, adds that word to the sentence, generates a new word and then adds that sentence and keep on doing this to keep generating sentences which form paragraphs, which form documents. And by design, GPT is best for incremental tasks, tasks where you use previous information to generate the next step or next value like an algorithm or a cooking recipe or even writing an email for you, say given a prompt. And GPT is very bad at discontinuous tasks where you need the output in order to go backwards and give some of the input, like telling a joke. Since when you tell a joke, you have to, when you're writing a joke, you have to start with writing the punchline at the end and then take the punchline and work backwards. GPT cannot do this because it generates the joke word for word. And that's why GPT is not a good comedian. GPT has over a hundred trillion parameters. That's a lot of parameters we need to train. So how do we train a GPT-like model? Well, it's made up of two different steps. You have the pre-training and the fine-tuning. According to the OpenAI blog, the pre-training phase is where we train our transformer on text data from the internet so that it can correctly complete documents. So our GPT so far is like just a transformer that's a document completer. So given like the beginning of a legal document, it can write out the rest of the document and it's seen thousands of them. So it's able to do so realistically. And it took OpenAI thousands of GPUs to train, you know, GPT across billions of characters from the internet. Then you have the fine tuning stage where we want to turn GPT from a document completer into a question answerer that we know of. So. We want to collect training data like we want to collect data in terms of a prompt and a response in a supervised way so that GPT can essentially expect a question at the top and then it'll write an answer at the bottom. And then they use a different network to predict how well GPT is able to answer the questions. And they also run reinforcement learning so that they're able to fine tune GPT so that it generates text that gives it the largest reward where we define reward as how relevant its answer is to the question where there is a little bit of human intervention here, but essentially one, we want to train GPT to generate the text that best answers the question. Now listen up. This is the most important part of the video. We're going to talk about the attention decoder mechanism, which is behind how a transformer works. So this famous paper by Google researchers called attention is all you need because it really is all you need. It explains how modern day transformers work and how these transformers have been able to be used in so many other powerful NLP models. And the idea is we want to decode human language to generate more human language. OpenAI uses these, this decoder slightly different to actually generate subwords instead of actual words or instead of characters and it uses a much higher vocabulary, but the idea is still the same. We want to gather information from the past characters that have interacted with the current character in a data-dependent way. For example, 
in Hello World, the E has a vowel that has interacted in very specific ways depending on our training data, especially with the other consonants and the exclamation point at the end. And we want to describe all this. Essentially, we're going to create our own matrix to describe this using to compare how each character relates to each other or how relevant each character is to one another in a sentence. And again, the attention mechanism works the same way for generating new new characters and generating new words. So for our sentence, each character or each word, we're going to do characters here, each character at each position in the sentence is turned into a vector that records the character itself, but also its position in the sentence. And we call this the key. Each character also has a second vector called the value, which is another vector representation of the character as well as its position, but it shape is a little bit different so that it allows us to do matrix multiplication eventually with the third vector, which is called the query. The query each character has is essentially the next character that the current character is looking for. For example, for Hello World, the query for E could be looking for an L or two Ls. And so the idea is we want to dot product each current query vector individually by all the previous key vectors. And if you look closely, we're ignoring the keys for future characters because we're trying to find the context of the past characters as we're finding each of the dot products of the current query vector by all the previous keys. Remember that each of these six groups of numbers represents how related each character is to the previous characters. So therefore, our attention mechanism is going to prioritize and look for the largest values in each of these groups and the previous characters that caused those large dot products with the current character. So that our mechanism is going to pay attention to those previous characters that caused those large dot products. As it sends those characters encoded as vectors, our mechanism is going to send them to the next layer of our transformer, which itself could be another attention mechanism, or it could just be a feed forward or output layer. In practice, we actually wouldn't use a nested for loop to multiply each query by all the previous keys that would just take too long. Instead, according to the paper, we would combine all the queries into a matrix and all the keys into a matrix. We would just concatenate the vectors into a matrix and multiply all the queries by all the keys. From the dot products of the rows of the queries by the columns of the keys, we would get the raw context each character has with each other. But when we look at each character, we only really care about the context of the characters that come before it, not after it. It wouldn't make sense to look at the character's context on future characters. That would be like using the future to predict the past or, or it'd just be weird. So we want to get rid of the upper triangular part of this raw dot producted matrix. And we do so by masking the upper triangular part with zeros. Then once we have our lower triangular context matrix, we want to have an even distribution. So we want to scale the values to preserve the variance and apply a soft max function on the matrix to exponentiate the values. That way, all the values in our matrix can add up to one, and it can be better interpreted as each entry representing how related one character is to another character in terms of a percentage that's just much more explainable and easier to work with so that we know how many of the previous characters we need to aggregate when we make a context-based prediction. And transformers are actually made up of a bunch of these different attention mechanisms, which look at different parts of the input. But for transformers, you want to connect these attention mechanisms to a regular sequential layer with a nonlinear activation function, followed by an output layer to, you know, output the probabilities of each character, like that is pretty standard for neural networks in the vocabulary from appearing next. So again, it's going to output the probabilities of each character in the vocabulary for appearing next. And then we just pick the character with the highest probability as our answer. This is how a transformer works. And it works because it uses an attention mechanism that is able to correct successfully get the context of a sentence using an attention matrix. And this is the answer to why chat GPT and GPT-4 are so powerful and why it generates such realistic looking text. The reason it generates such relevant text has to do with the fine tuning stage of the like, reinforcement learning I was talking about earlier, but that's much easier to explain. This is the decoding human language part of ChatGPT. That is the reason why it's able to generate such realistic looking text. And GPT is specifically a single decoder transformer. 
so that it decodes human language and generates output, as opposed to other transformers which have an encoder and a decoder. So if you're trying to translate between another language and another language, you want to encode the first language and then use that to, and then use a decoder to decode the encoded language into the second language. But here in GPT, we just use one single decoder. So there are three main ways that we can scale this transformer to optimize it for large data sets. The first one is using residual connections. So the idea is you start with the inputs and then you branch off each attention mechanism and keep adding it to a single channel. So each attention mechanism is kind of like its own fork or its own branch. It branches off and then it adds the values to a single like pipe, which is the residual pathway until you reach the targets. So the residual pathway is the sum of all the previous targets. And the reason that this helps with optimization is because initially residual connections don't impact training at the beginning of it, but I mean, it lets kind of, it lets the gradients flow forward and back propagate very well and unimpededly. But during later stages, the residual trainings help optimize the training to be much faster and much, much better. The second optimization technique is layer normalization, which essentially you normalize the layers over a batch of inputs, which is a very, very common technique in neural nets. It's nothing special. It's been around for a while. Dropout is also another technique that GPT uses where we essentially randomly set a certain small percentage of the weights to just, we just kind of essentially throw them out. And this helps our model generate be generalize better and reduces the chance of overfitting. So if GPT-4 has a hundred trillion parameters and our brain has like around a hundred to 600 trillion parameters, then GPT-4 could be big enough to resemble or if not be better than a human brain. Uh, if it's not GPT-4, it's going to be future GPT versions where we're going to discover AGI. I'm very confident in this. And OpenAI is probably going to be the first company to create a model that has what it takes to become a fully, the first fully sentient and conscious artificial general intelligence so that it can learn to do any task better than humans can. And I think the key behind a transformer being conscious is that if a large language model can explain to us what it feels like to be conscious without having seen consciousness related training data, that explanation had to come from somewhere. And that somewhere is the consciousness of the neural network. But he said the smile to me was the, uh, was passing the Turing test mm. for consciousness, that you smile for no audience. Mm. You smile for yourself. You take in an experience for the experience sake. I don't know. Um, that seemed more like consciousness versus the ability to convince somebody else that you're conscious. So I think there's many other tasks, tests like that, that, we could look at too. Um, but, you know, my personal beliefs, consciousness is if something very strange is going on. According to this paper that came out a couple days ago, GPT-4 also has a lot of similar characteristics, again, to artificial general intelligence. The paper is titled Sparks of AGI because GPT and other large language models are like kind of stones where striking together to form sparks. But essentially, we keep striking these tools together. We're gonna take one of those sparks is gonna form a fire. And I don't know if you want to be there for that fire, but we're discovering a new potential large fire with AI. And with a big enough spark, it's going to kind of revolutionize humanity as it already has. And this is how ChatGPT and GPT-4 works. Thank you for watching.